Hello and welcome to Berry Aftercare, the podcast. You probably just heard that on the intro, so redundancy reigns. Well, today I'm talking about something I am majorly passionate about. And you've heard me be very majorly passionate in the past, but today takes the cake on passionate topics in the Berry Aftercare world. So, Today's topic is the blankety blank, bleepity bleep, goal weight. Let's get right into this. So if you haven't had weight loss surgery, but you're planning to, or if you're going to do a medical weight loss program or you're doing the GLP, however you're losing weight, let's assume you're working with a healthcare provider and let's assume that healthcare provider, like so many other healthcare providers, who are doing a huge disservice to those who want to lose weight, ask you this very disservicing question. So what is your goal weight? Uh, uh, uh. That sends off big time signals within my brain. That is not a good question for a provider to ask a person. Anywho, if you are asked that question by your healthcare provider, Here's what I suggest you say. Hmm, let's see, what is my goal weight? Well, well, I think I'd like to be maybe 120 pounds. And hey, hey, doctor, while you're at it, do you think you could make me like five feet, 11 inches and perhaps give me the face and figure of, oh, let's say Charlie's Theron? That's how absurd that question is. What purpose is there? in asking a patient their goal weight. I say it's a huge setup for that person to go into mind-blowing failure mode. Let's talk about the reasons this upsets me so, so, so much. And I'm basing this on 20 years experience working in the bariatric field. And more than that, I'm ba- you know what I just thought of when I said that? <laughs> Little side trial here. Did you ever see the movie Cool Runnings? The mama in there says about her son. Oh, what did she say? Somebody's saying something about her son. I'll give you more than that. She just turns into full mama bear. And I'm like, oh, I love it. in her Jamaican accent, which mine wasn't very Jamaican. But hey, that's what it reminded me of. It makes me a little bit incensed when professional providers ask a patient their goal weight. And I've probably fallen into that trap over the years. But in addition to working in the field of weight loss for 20 years, I suffered from anorexia for several years as a much younger woman. And a goal weight ruled my world for a long time. And so I know I'm not alone in this. And many of you have been ruled by a really random number in your head for a lot more years than I suffered with that torment. So in my role as a professional in the bariatric world, primarily with weight loss surgery patients, I always ask people prior to having surgery, What is the reason that you want to have surgery? What is the reason you want to lose this weight? And more importantly, what are the reasons you want to keep this weight off for the rest of your life? So we're asking your whys. What are your whys? What are the reasons you want to lose weight? And I want to point out to people that if your goal when you go on a supervised weight loss program or you have weight loss surgery, if your goal is to lose weight, my friends, you're going in with the wrong goal in the first place. Although I understand from a patient perspective that the goal is to get that God awful weight off, that weight that has caused you so much shame from other people, name calling, pointing, staring, nasty comments, being treated less fairly by colleagues, less fairly by supervisors, less fairly by the world. I understand the emotional desire to get that weight off. 
But when you set out to lose weight, please challenge yourself to go beyond, I want to get that weight off because chances are you've done that in the past. Let the goal be, I want to develop a healthy lifestyle so that I can maintain that weight loss. Getting the weight off is step A. And if that's the only step you have in mind, then I am here to tell you, you're setting yourself up for failure a little bit from the get-go. Because if your goal is to lose weight, then what happens when you get there? What happens when you've lost weight? Is everything over and done with and then you repeat the cycle like maybe you've done 15, 20, two, I don't know, times in the past? I hope not. Goal A, get the weight off. Goal B, maintain a healthy weight for the rest of your life. Not a specific number weight, a healthy weight for your body. I know you're already frustrated with me, maybe, but please listen on. Again, I will say, I understand from the perspective of a person who has struggled with weight, you desperately want to get that weight off. And I understand that. I, I have compassion for that for sure. But I want you to understand that weight loss is only part of the goal. And if you're, if you're in this for the long haul, and if you're looking at your whys, your reasons for having weight loss, then I want to lose weight, then I want you to think further down the line which is a little bit contrary to what I often say is quit looking down the road. But goal A, get the weight off. Long-term goal, maintain that weight loss and live at a healthy weight for your body. A healthy weight for your body, please listen to this definition. And even if you don't buy into it at this particular point in time, consider this as a possibility for a definition of healthy weight for your body. And I derive this from the information I receive from patients preparing to have weight loss surgery because what they tell me prior to having the surgery is this. You know, there are <clears throat> different iterations of this, but when it all boils down, there are two primary things people want. They want to live a healthy life. They want to be off as many medications as they possibly can. They want to get rid of the comorbidities associated with carrying extra weight, the high blood pressure, the diabetes, the high cholesterol, the um, uh, improvements in asthma, a lot of the uh, inflammatory diseases that are related to the types of foods they eat may settle down. So people want to live a healthier lifestyle. They want their medical conditions to be as minimal as possible. Just like the disease of obesity, there are a lot of medical conditions that have components to them that we cannot influence. For example, genetics. The disease of obesity, there are factors you can influence, there are factors you cannot. You cannot really influence your, the household within which you were raised. That's in the past, you were fed what you were fed. You cannot influence too much your genetic history when it comes to where you're at today. You cannot influence certain medications you may have to take for specific ailments at this time. Maybe at some point in time, those can be altered or changed, but some medications have weight gaining properties. So there are some things you can influence and some things you cannot. Things you can influence include things you put in your mouth, if you get up and move your body, uh, what types of food you eat, those kinds of things, the amount of food you eat, those sorts of things. And the same is true with other medical conditions. For example, blood pressure, a lot of it is hereditary. You can do all the things that are recommended to decrease your blood pressure. You may still have high blood pressure. So one of the goals for maintaining a healthy weight is to have as good a medical palate as possible. I want to be off as many medications and live as healthy as I can in this moment and each moment going forward. So improved medical conditions. 
Secondly, I want to have an improved quality of life. So for a lot of people who are carrying a lot of extra weight, it's difficult to get around as easily as they want to. There's a lot of being out of breath when they try to keep up with the family on vacation. There's a lot of difficulty sometimes getting up off the floor if you're on the floor playing with kids or grandkids because of joint pain. There's a lot of physicality that makes life more difficult when you're carrying extra weight in terms of even buttoning your own clothes or taking care of some personal hygiene or uh, just being able to engage in the kinds of things you want to have the quality of life that you want. So basically, the whys that people share with me fall into those two categories, improved health, better quality of life for the long haul. And those are great whys. These are my values. You can call them all kinds of different things. We want to live our life based on our principles of, and our values of wanting to be healthy, wanting to be able to get around, do the things that we want to do. I call those meaningful matters. That's Connie speak. What matters to you, what's meaningful to you. And then here's what happens. Here's what happens when people have been in the weight loss process for a long time, they've lost quite a bit of weight, their health is indeed improved. Maybe they're off all of their medications, maybe they're off all but one or two, but definitely there's been an improvement in their physical health. And quality of life, oh my goodness, people are out there doing things that they've always wanted to do there jumping out of airplanes, they're participating in 5Ks, they're riding bicycles, they are swimming in pools, they are you know, going on hikes with family members and grandkids and going on vacation and keeping up and they are living an amazing life. It's a glorious, glorious thing. And then, what do I hear with the patients I work with who are two, three, four, five, eight, ten, twelve years out, they're going, but I never made it to my goal weight, and I want to go through the roof. It absolutely shocks me every time. But as I've been in this field longer and longer and longer and longer, not only does it shock me still, but it kind of annoys me. It frustrates me. It saddens me deeply. Because when you've done those things, when you've improved your health dramatically, and you are, by your own words, living the life that you want to live, and you go back to this goal, goal weight, I can't even say it. It makes me crazy. What in the world? So let's talk a little bit about that thing called the goal weight. First of all, professionals, what? What is the reason you are asking people what they want to weigh? How absurd is that? Uh, I'm going to do surgery on you, and I'd like to ask you, what would you like to weigh? As if it has any merit on where that person is going to end up. You're going to plug it in. Okay. Patient A, five foot seven, currently 336, would like to be 122. Let me plug that into the. What is that? That's insanity. It has no bearing on anything unless you are following up with the words, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> My job, in my estimation, when I work with patients, is I will say them, I will ask them, you know, has the doctor given you information on how much weight you are likely to lose? And that's when I find out the doctors are the one asking for the, what would you like, what's your goal weight? Please, doctors, knock that crap off. It's very unlikely that many of the patients are going to give you a number that is realistic for their genetic history, for their current set of circumstances, 
for their lifestyle because almost always it's way too low. Not always. I love it when I have somebody say, you know what? I'm happy if I just lose 50 pounds. And the stats on the surgery they've chosen say they're going to lose 75. You know, that's like, oh, thank God. They're not setting themselves up for failure. So if you tell any of the professionals a goal weight and they don't tell you if that is realistically possible, given the numbers that they have, there is a formula. Is it accurate every time? Of course not. But given the hundreds and thousands of patients it's based on, it's pretty darn accurate. So I go over those numbers with most people if they tell me a number and it's so far off. Because we know, we know from science and from literature that if you're going to have the gastric sleeve, you are going to lose 60 to 65 percent of your excess weight. That does not mean your total weight. It's your excess weight. So if if the number on the wall in the doctor's office says you ought to weigh 130 pounds, which don't even get me started, that's kind of a crock too, but it's somewhere to start. If that says you're going to weigh, or if you're this height, you should be 130 pounds, but you're, and you're 100 pounds overweight, so you weigh 230, that surgery, the gastric sleeve, will get 60 to 65 pounds off of you. So if you're in the doctor's office and you weigh 230 pounds and the doctor says, how much would you like to weigh? And you say 115, then that doctor better be saying that will not happen. Even if you say 140, the doctor better say that's not likely. It could happen, but here are the statistics. Here's what science shows. Given your weight, given what the parameters for your height are, Given your biological history, given da 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 da, we know that this surgery gets off this much weight. If you've got 100 pounds to lose, it's 60 to 65 pounds. If you're having the gastric bypass, 70 to 75 pounds off that extra weight. And it's more with each different surgery. So there is a formula, and that tends to be accurate. Sometimes people will get a little lower. But the normal thing after surgery anyway, is to rebound just a little bit. So for a lot of people, that formula proves to be very, very accurate. But the last thing I want to do is see a patient and give them unrealistic expectations because patients who struggled with weight forever already are so very hard on themselves then I don't want them thinking they're going to get down to what that number on the chart in the doctor's office says, because that's, you know, I hate even saying ideal weight, but that's what science medicine currently says. This is a good weight for your height. You're not going to get there. It's a percentage of your excess weight. So don't think that it's reasonable to get there, but I'll exercise and I'll do more things, Connie. Good. I'm glad you need to. That's a healthy lifestyle right there. But don't do it to get to a number. And now we're going to talk about that number. What is the deal with the flipping number? It is a number. It does not. You know this. You've heard it. You've read it. It does not define your worth. And as intelligent as each one of you is, or are, is, you fall prey, you fall victim to the, this is the number I want to be at. We have to do something about this in the community. And I'm hoping that you will help move people along and away from this idea of a goal weight because it's keeping people sick it's keeping people stuck. It's keeping them in what we're going to talk about in just a minute, which is diet mentality. Diet mentality is an illness in our country and spreading throughout the world. We want to get away from that for peace of mind. 
for joy of living, for freedom from the obsession with weight. Most people who decide to have weight loss surgery or most people who have the disease of obesity or morbid obesity need to lose weight to have a healthier lifestyle, not to have more value. And I know that's another whole topic because as a society, part of this societal illness is assigning value to a size. We all fall victim to that to some degree. And even those who protest the loudest, and it's usually people, you know, who, well, erase that thought, forget about it. That's another train I don't want to go down right now. But and when we focus on a number and we associate it with our own value, even if we say, you know what, everybody else in the room, there's a hundred other people in here. I don't, I don't care what you weigh. You know, I, I want for you to be healthy. I want you to be off as many medications, not have any comorbidities associated with the disease of obesity. I want you to live your best life. Get out there, do the things. But me, mm -mm, I got to get to that goal weight, you see. I don't think your value is associated with the number, but I think mine is. That's basically where people fall. They're judging themselves so harshly and so critically. And this is the same person, which is mostly all of us, we don't want to be judged by other people. We don't want to be judged for our size. We don't want to be judged for our weight. We don't want to be judged for the color of our hair. We don't want to be judged for the size of our shoes or our boobs or our nose. We want to be seen for who we are. But what do we do? We judge ourselves on that number. It's a really unhealthy dichotomy. We cannot be living by these two sets of rules. It's okay for you, but not for me. That's the double standard, right? And none of us like to be judged. None of us like to be judged for our hair color, eye color, skin color, religious preference, gender preference, sexual preference, height preference, whatever it is. We don't want to be judged for it. And yet we judge ourselves brutally. We will judge ourselves harshly, critically, and brutally. And we do that when we play goal weight. So I'm going to tell you about the scale and what it does and what it does not do. And I want you to notice that there is one or two or three issues in what it does. And there's a whole laundry list of things that it does not do. What the scale tells you is how much weight you're, how much I don't know, I should have looked up the definition, something about your mass and gravity and whatever. But what it tells you is a piece of data, one piece of data. Now this one piece of data can be useful to you or it can be damaging and destroying to you. And the choice is yours. So if I'm going to use this piece of data in a constructive way like Laura Preston does in the Berry Aftercare room, every single week, she uses the number on the scale as a piece of data. And this data informs her if she's staying relatively the same in her weight, if she's trending up or down, and if there's a trend in either direction, it gives you information. It gives you information about your overall tendencies, regarding what you're putting in your mouth, the quality, and you can look if you're keeping a journal, right? It can give you information that you can then use to make alterations in your lifestyle. But it gives you one piece of data as information. Here's what the scale does not tell you. It does not tell you, based on that number, I'm a better person than I was yesterday because I lost two pounds. That means people are going to like me better. They don't give a rat's patoot what your number is. Are you going to look at your friend at work today and go, were you up or down a 
a scale or two, a point or two, a pound or two. Oh, I was up three pounds. Well, I don't like you today, boy. You have no value. No, you're not. Why are you doing that to yourself? And you know you do. Can you see why I'm all worked up about this nonsense? Nonsense. It is nonsensical. It is illogical. It is super unhealthy. If you're doing this, I am telling you there's a part of you that is super unhealthy. And I'm not judging you. I'm telling you, I've been there. I was super unhealthy in the head in this area for years, for years. It's a segment, it's a subset of your mental health. And if you are judging yourself by a scale, and that scale is making you feel worthy or unworthy, that's mental, mental health issue, friends. Absolutely, indeed, without a doubt. So the scale isn't telling you I'm a better person today than I was yesterday if I lost weight, and I'm a much worse person today than I was yesterday because I gained a few pounds. The scale does not say that. If that's happening, it's coming from in here. You're doing it to you, but you're not doing it to the hundred people in your office. That doesn't work. Now, the scale does not tell you if your parents your friends, your partner, your children, or strangers like, dislike, approve, or disapprove of you. You don't have to tell them what the scale says for one thing, but maybe you're so trained and it's so ingrained in you that this number represents, and it probably comes from a long time ago, you weren't approved of because you were overweight. That doesn't fit today. And you have to work with some professionals, preferably, to work through that so you don't continue to torment yourself. It hurts my heart to think that I did that to myself, and it hurts my heart to know that so many people are continuing to do that. The scale. Oh, I forgot to tell you. This goes into the what it does tell you part, but I'll stick with what it doesn't tell you. The scale does not tell you that the people in your life treasure you, regardless of that number. It does not tell you that the people in your life are happy when you're around. It doesn't tell you that, that you matter to the people in your life who love you for who you are. The scale doesn't tell you that. The scale doesn't tell you how your friends value your support. It doesn't tell you how people appreciate your kindnesses. It doesn't tell you how much they value you for understanding them, listening to them, being there with and for them. The scale doesn't tell you that, but you wipe all that goodness out by judging yourself by this one little number. I hope that hurts your heart. It hurts my heart. The scale does not define your worth. You do by your own self-talk. As an adult, the responsibility for increasing your self-confidence, your self-efficacy, your self-value, your self-esteem, your self-confidence, the self of all the selves, fall squarely on you. And you have to do that by giving the scale no more power. Do not give this scale power. Do not give your parents power over your life if you're 50 years old. Do not give a five-year-old power to rule your household. You are a healthy adult and you need to learn to make healthier decisions. And sometimes that requires having help. So the scale again tells you about your gravity on this earth. It tells you one piece of information. And here's something it does do. It indicates perhaps how much effort you're putting into your, your journey, but maybe even not, because I know there are a lot of people who put a lot of effort into the journey and the scale doesn't move. So it may or may not do that, but it tells you one piece of data that you have to put into context 
with all the other things in your world related to your weight and your journey. So first of all, that number on the scale is not your goal. Secondly, it doesn't define you. But what happens is people get all caught up in this diet mentality. So I have a couple of websites that I got some information from about diet mentality and diet culture. So a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you right now is from those websites and from my experience, but hey, sometimes they word it better. So I'm going to share with you some stuff about diet mentality and diet culture because my work as a psychologist is to try to help you get out of this rat race of a diet mentality and away from the diet culture, which is so pervasive that it's difficult to do. So what do I even mean by diet mentality? Well, a diet mentality is like your thoughts, your beliefs, your perceptions, your observations that come from either that linger from past dieting experiences or that have been shaped and reinforced by diet culture. So it might be that, you know, your mom was always on a diet and she always dragged you into the diets. And so you've lived this diet way of life. That is a diet mentality. I'm always on a diet or what's the next diet or life is always about a diet and the number on the scale. So the diet mentality is pervasive. It pervades our culture, socially, throughout the media, in the movies, in your family. You, your family might have a, a cultural thing of diet mentality. You know, the media, the schools, advertising, it's everywhere. And so it's really difficult to extricate or get out of that way of living because it leads to this horrific cycle of yo-yo dieting. It leaves you feeling depressed, less than, unworthy, frustrated, and ultimately disappointed in yourself. This is a cultural sickness. It absolutely is. And it's going to take every, I don't know, people are going to have to extricate themselves from this diet mentality, this diet culture, one person at a time, because I doubt it's going to ever end because it sells products. It sells the billions of weight loss things. But here are some questions that I found on one of the sites. It's eight signs you might be stuck in diet mentality. Number one, you don't allow yourself to eat certain foods. If you have a food addiction, there are some foods that should be off limits. But if you're not, you don't allow because they're bad. These are bad. Those are bad foods. What are you doing eating those bad foods? Or maybe you've eliminated entire food groups from your diet for non-allergy related. It's not like you're allergic to it. You just have eliminated the whole thing because culture says these are bad, right? It causes a lot of confusion and a lot of mental energy. So maybe you're absolutely obsessed with counting calories, macros. Now, this has a place in accountability. So awareness is one thing, obsession is another. Um, if you are not on a particular diet, just cutting back or eliminating certain things, you're constantly looking for a new eating plan on the internet or reading a new diet book. It's just like constantly obsessed and focused on this diet, 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 diet mentality. You talk to your friends and your family all the time about, oh, what diet are we on this week? Ugh. What a, what a not healthy way to spend your energy and your effort and focusing your attention on this. Um, you feel like you have to, you have to exercise so many days a week, especially if you ate something bad. So all of these are signs of the diet mentality. To me, the biggest one is the goal weight. So this diet culture is how our society glamorizes thinness, glamorizes, um, you know, they, they taunt you and tease you with all the junk food. But if you cross the line and now you're overweight, now they're going to criticize and condemn you. So it's a very, very, very thing, right? A very difficult thing. You want to be with the in people and the in people are drinking all the time and they're doing all the things and they're, they look like they're eating whatever they want and they're stick thin. Look at the people in the movies. Look at the people on television. Look at the people who we glamorize 
or we follow or we, you know, we make into gods or goddesses because of their physical attributes. Now, can we admire them? Absolutely. Just like we can admire somebody who's 45 pounds overweight for how they look or what they're doing with their life. It shouldn't have anything to do with that, but society as a whole, we glamorize thinness, we glamorize fitness, we glamorize weight loss. Now, weight loss and health, weight loss as it relates to health can be an important thing. We, we meaning people in the profession and hopefully people in your family, want you to be at a weight that is healthy for your body. If that is, what, regardless of the number on the scale, if you are able to not have a lot of physical comorbidities and you're able to do the things you want, then that is freaking amazing. You are living your best life. Give yourself permission to do so. All right, so diet culture isn't just in the adult world, right? It's all over. It's in books we read as children. It's in conversations children hear from their adults in their lives. All through my childhood, you know, my mom had the thing that you stood on and shaked your body. And she and her girlfriends were always talking about the latest diet. Taking those little diet chewies, they were sitting out on the counter. We'd pick them up and eat them. So we also see the diet culture evidenced very, very strongly at the beginning of the year. New Year's resolutions, right? Oh my God, the whole world's going on a diet. What are your resolutions? Well, I'm going to lose some weight. You know, that's evidence that our society is obsessed with this diet culture. And it's insidious, meaning it's unhealthy and it's going to drag you in because it's everywhere. People at work talk about diets. People at work go on diets. They have competitions for weight loss. How many people who go on those competitions do well and gain their weight right back? Most you know, diet culture says that we worship, we worship thinness. We're never good enough. We're never, our value is all about our physical appearance. It's not about our health status. It's not about the lives we choose to live and the places we choose to go and the things that we choose to do that bring us joy and happiness. So it shows up on magazine headlines. It shows up on billboards. It shows up on television. It shows up on, you know, the latest diet fads, the water cooler at work or the office chatter among coworkers. It shows up when people shame and blame others for their weight. It shows up when you shame, blame, and talk negatively to yourself. It shows up in your negative self-talk. I'm fat. I'm ugly. Why do I bother? I can't eat this because it's, you know, it's off limits. I can't eat after such and such a time because God knows everybody who does will gain some weight. Oh my God, I can't eat breakfast because if I don't eat breakfast, I can make it through the entire day. Diet culture, diet mentality, diet culture, diet mentality, unhealthy way of living. And it is nationwide dare I say, worldwide, right? I'm a bad person. I ate a bad food. I have to overcompensate with my exercise because I ate a bad food. Um, that kind of thing. We do live in a diet world. So what I implore you to do is to remember that if you are at a healthy weight, few comorbidities, you're off a lot of medications and you're able to do the things you want, you're at a healthy weight for your body. And here are some reasons why diet mentality is unhealthy for individuals and for society. Because for some people, and maybe for you, you've been in that cycle of weight cycling, yo-yo dieting, and it takes a physical toll on your body. We knew, we know that this is not good. It messes up your metabolism. It messes up blood pressure. It messes up cholesterol levels, and it can even cause or lead to heart disease. And this is based on a lot of research, a lot of studies. The dieting, 
you know, the diet mentality, the diet focus and weight stigma absolutely affects your self-esteem. And that's where we run into those double standards. You love the people you love because of who they are. And I'll bet some of the people you love carry a few extra pounds. You love them anyway, and they love you, but you don't give yourself. We're going to give each other grace. Okay, that's a great thing. As long as you give yourself the same kind of grace you're given the person you love who carries extra weight. But we don't do that. We're hypocrites. I'm going to give you grace, but I'm going to hold myself accountable and find this darn gold weight. Oh, makes me crazy. Hey, that was my Scottish accent. What did you think? All right, so diet mentality and all this dieting absolutely can lead to eating disorders. Hello, I have eating disorder brain to this day at some time. And sometimes I spent several years <laughs> addicted to the scale. And that scale absolutely determined my worth. That scale absolutely determined if I were a lovable human being or a total uh, person who deserved nothing from nobody. So the bottom line is diet mentality, constant dieting are really detrimental to your physical and your emotional health. All that guilt and shame, the spiral, right? Oh my God, I feel guilty if I eat. I feel shameful if I gained weight. Um, and then you're in a bad mood. Then you take it out on others. So it affects your, your people too, right? So we have increased worry. We have increased stress. We have increased anxiety in our culture. We have it associated with a lot of things, but definitely this diet mentality and this diet culture, this all or nothing thing. A lot of people struggle with that. And it's the culture. It's the diet mentality. This absolute thinking, I must or I mustn't. I should or I shouldn't. I have to or I can't. The catastrophic thinking, oh my God, if I gain a pound, I'm going to gain 70. And I'm horrible. It's so sad. It is just so sad. So people get caught up. And then we have this lifestyle filled with thoughts of food and diets and weight and a goal weight. And it's really a tragic way to live. So in my job, I want to help people shed this diet mentality. So how can people do that? First of all, you have to be aware of it, right? Do I live in diet mentality mode? And if we're honest with ourselves, most of us do to some degree or another. But has this become a way of life for you? And here's the deal. Just because you lose weight, regardless of how you lose it, it doesn't fix that diet mentality, mental health issue. It messes with your mental health. It messes with your mental health, which I refer to as a mental health issue. So the diet mentality doesn't change just because you've lost weight yet again. We have to work on getting that away. So being aware that maybe you have it is the first step. And then you might need to get help. You might need to get help and you might need to enlist the help of the people in your family. You know what, family? We're going to quit talking about dieting. We're going to quit talking about calories. We're going to quit talking about, you know, those sorts of things. And what we're going to do is we're going to focus on, let's eat real food. You know, we can have, you know, it's not going to be rigid or perfectionistic, but for the most part, let's eat real food. Let's cook real food. Let's make this a family thing. Sure, there are going to be times when, you know, we don't have to do it perfectly, but let's just focus on healthy lifestyle. Is this healthy living? Let's do it together. Get your family. Be the one. I can't remember who's catchphrase that is, but be the one in the family to start the change. It's one of the self-help people and I can't remember who does it, but, and Jamie Kern Lima, who wrote um, Worthy, talks about, you're not crazy, you're just the first. So be the first in the family to get on with the business of healthy living and loving your body for what it's able to do. So first of all, we gotta be aware, secondly, we need to realize when this is creeping in in our day. 
And you're going to be probably amazed at how often this diet mentality, the judgment of others, the lack of, you know, how society does it. Try to start noticing people without judgment. Try to start noticing yourself without judgment. We had a, a conference about emotional eating and food addiction recently. And one of the, one of the things that people said is, you know, there's an exercise where people look in the mirror clothed or naked and they they're learning to love their body. And there was a participant who said, that's never going to happen for me. I'm never going to, I just am not going to love my body. So maybe you can find appreciation for your body. I think that's an easier thing to do. So maybe rather than saying, oh my God, I suck. I gained five pounds and that's not my goal weight. Maybe say, you know what? Look at these arms. These arms are able to hug every person I love. Look at these legs with all their imperfections, their lumps, their bumps, their cellulite, their scars, their scabs, their brown spots, their whatever. These legs can get up off the ground and carry me where I want to go. That is living a healthy life, my friends, because you ask somebody who can't walk and they're going to say, you damn well better be grateful for those legs because I'd love to have them. So maybe we can start having appreciation for the bodies that we have, regardless of their imperfections, regardless of the number on that scale, as long as we are putting forth effort to be healthy and do the things that we want to be able to do. So get rid of some of the rules. It's okay to have some rules if it's going to lead you farther from your goals. If it's going to take you away from your goals, it's okay to say, I don't want people eating in my car. It's just not a safe thing to do because we just get into all kinds of eating unhealthy foods in the car. So we're going to eat at the table. You know, that's not a horrible thing. All right. Uh, work on challenging some of these things that you've set for yourself. Say, you know, um, I'm going to say no eating in my car. People don't like it too bad. I know that if I allow myself to eat in the car, I'm going to go through drive throughs And so if I say no eating in the car, it prevents me from going through the drive through So set your life up for safety. You want to have a safe life. You want to protect your own mental and physical health by setting yourself up for safety like you would if you had toddlers in your home, by having gates on your steps. If you've got teenagers, hopefully you limit screen time. Hopefully you take away their phones at some time and make them go to bed without them. You know, you set up limits because we want our children to grow up healthy and happy. We have to set limits for ourselves and we have to give ourselves permission to be happy if we are healthy without a lot of comorbidities associated with our weight and we're able to do the things that we want to do. So again, if a doctor asks you what your goal weight is, you say, I'll tell you if you can make me look like whoever it is you think is ooh, all that. So it's a ridiculous number. Get rid of it. Live your life. Be happy. And think about your whys. People say, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm doing this. And then they revert to that number. I'm going to encourage you and implore you to really keep your reasons for living a healthy life front and center on your computer screen, on your phone screen, on your refrigerator, on your makeup mirror, wherever you need to see it. This is the reason I'm doing this, not a number to live the life I want to live and then define where that is and go do it. So our take home messages today are goal weights are a signal of a mental health issue. That's probably not an accurate saying, but I'm saying it because if it messes up your mental health in terms of self-worth, then I may, I'm, I'm going to call that a mental health issue. We may need to enlist the help of a coach, a life coach, a bariatric coach, a dietitian, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a mentor, a support group to help us get away from that diet mentality, that diet culture. And I would implore you with your friends and the people in your life, set some boundaries. I'm not talking about this. This is a topic I'm no longer discussing and because it's not where I want to live my life. I want to live my life talking about and doing the things that bring me joy, not that bring me down. And diet mentality and diet culture are going to bring you down pretty much every time. So let's be the one, be the first within your friend group, within your family to change the dialogue.
to say, we're not talking about that. Let's talk about what we can do. Let's talk about how we can stay healthy together. Let's talk about the things we can do and enjoy our lives together. It's your choice. You have the ability. No doubt you have the ability, but it is your choice about how you want to live. Maybe you want to stay immersed in that diet culture. Maybe you want to stay immersed in that diet mentality because it keeps you from thinking about other things. But maybe if you thought about those other things that maybe you don't want to think about, you can work through them and they won't bother you anymore. So you don't have to have an escape. Anywho, that's another topic. So today, the bleepity bleep, blankety blank, goal weight, please disintegrate it. Find some visualization where you burn that thing, bury that thing, disintegrate that thing, blow that thing up, but it no longer exists. A healthy weight for your body. Define it for yourself, but it shouldn't have anything to do with the number. And hopefully has to do with the quality of your life, the things you do that you want to do and are able to do, and being as physically healthy as you can. <sighs> I'll try not to talk about this one again for another year. Not going to happen. It'll probably be next week. But thanks for listening. Please share this with everybody you know professionals, friends, and tell them, I am extricating myself from the diet culture. I am extricating myself from the diet mentality, and I am not going to use that number on the scale as anything but a piece of evidence to help keep me in line with what I say is important to me. Mic drop. See you next week for another episode of Berry Aftercare, the podcast. And I hope you are checking out the Berry Aftercare group because we're doing great things in there and great people are involved in there and people are growing and learning and working toward loving themselves more and giving themselves permission to define their life by something other than a number. Join us, www.berryaftercare.com. See you next time, my friends. Bye-bye.